They're doing great. It's a birthday today. Oh, well, happy birthday yeah. to those two. It makes me look wonderful as a father, doesn't it? <laughs> Last time I saw like, what's, Today is my kid's birthday. Where are you? At the furry convention four states away. <laughs> She's sprouting up. She really is. She, uh... Is Henry also being... I know being that they're twins, they don't, they're not identical, but... He's a little shorter than her, but not much. Definitely take after my side of the family. Well, so. I was going to say, with, with QM being as small as she is, I'm oh, yeah. the kids are... Well, QM's, fa QM's the anomaly in their family. QM's family is big. Are they? They are a bit like my father-in-law... May burn in hell. He's not dead yet. I'm just six wishful thinking. Um, is a huge, huge guy. He, he's gigantic. Uh, and my family's not small. I mean, my family's all six feet or above. So the kids take after, and, uh, I would say, probably more my side of the family when it comes to height. And speaking of your side of the family, what's your dad think about your new position? Oh, he thinks it's wonderful. That's awesome. He thinks it's great. That is so awesome, though. Yeah, he's been telling me to get my ass out of that firm for years. So. I'm talking. I can't have another one talk. Uh, That's awesome. I take it the uh, streaming idea from your room didn't work out? Yeah, well, you know, that's what happens when you don't go to bed till 3 a.m. every night. Like the concept was I have one day where I'm not doing a lot of shit, so maybe I'll stream. I don't even brought the fucking gamepad, about everything I need just to sit there and play a video game in my, in my room. And then I just did not go back to my room the whole weekend. So, and when I did go to my room, I took a nap. Is everybody having a good last day of the convention? So far, yeah. yeah we got like 10 minutes before this starts, and this is just what I do. Everybody enjoy themselves? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Nobody has any huge blanks in their memory where they're sitting here and going, what the fuck did I do? Play a picture on your phone from the night before and scroll back. Who did I talk to? Who do I know you? Yeah, we met Saturday. Oh, no. <laughs> well, we'll ask this because I was like, do we have any other lawyers in the room? God damn it. <laughs> I was hoping for at least one. I did the basic law panel yesterday. I walked out. I got stopped by somebody. And he said, I'm a lawyer, too. And I'm like, I am so sorry. <laughs> you should have gotten their name. You know what? Um, no lie. It, it was, and this is the weird part about it, it really any professional at, at a furry convention. Because you run in to other professionals in your same field. But the, the doctors will run into doctors. EMTs will run into EMTs. Stockbrokers will run into stockbrokers. I had a lovely conversation with a steel worker this morning who, as we were talking about rolling steel, uh, another person says, oh, I do that too. And they had a professional cut right in front of me. I'm just going, this is amazing because you never know who the hell you're going to run into. And maybe it is a symptom of America that we all identify so much with our jobs because that's where you spend the vast majority of your adult life is doing things to make other people money. Uh, but as I was standing outside after basic law and they said, I'm an attorney too, we got to talking. And of course, it was, it was you know, a lawyer in cat ears talking to a lawyer wearing a name tag that reads the boozy badger who just got done screaming about law for an hour and we're out there. And we're giving each other references on lawyers to contact on specific. Like they had said, do you, you know, what about, do you, what do you know about kink law? Like, like making sure that people who are involved in kink are in polyamory. And I said, you know what? I've done a few of those. I haven't done a lot, but I'll tell you a really good resource. And I gave them the name of a lawyer I know in Seattle, Washington, where that's their entire practice is uh, queer, kink, and polyamorous law. That's all they do. As I said, just tell them I sent you. They'll talk to you for hours. They won't shut up about the topic. <laughs> um, and then they gave me names for workers' comp people. And I'm just like, you know, this is, and they walked off and I walked off and I, I got back towards the elevator and I thought, well, that's the weirdest networking lunch I've ever been to. <laughs> hey, but it worked. Yeah, yeah. 
It really does. It, uh, it, it's strange. It just goes to show the diversity of this group. I liked your reaction when you asked me what I did. I said I murdered her. I love that. Yeah, I, I, like, but, well, it's better than landscaping, isn't it? What do you do? I murdered the grass. Like, professionally, no, it's a hobby. <laughs> Why not both? At night, I go out, I wander the streets with a bottle of the pesticide and some shears. Considering what I was doing four days before the convention, yeah, pretty much. You just wake up in the morning, you look at your lawn, somebody's written T-Max on it, gasoline, and let a match. <laughs> I could do that. I won't, but I could. <laughs> we have five minutes. You know, I, I forgot to ask before, we talk about kitten. How's the coyote child? Oh, he's wonderful. He does not want to start kindergarten. Um, is, he actually was supposed to start Thursday. Now he's going to start Wednesday this week now because the school lost his vaccination records. So we have to get those facts back in, but he is set to start Wednesday morning now uh, oh, wow. in kindergarten. Yeah, geez. I cannot believe, uh, you know, I right? think back over the, the, well, not including the past two years, but you know, a few couple of years before oh, yeah. that, watching him go from, oh, yeah. you know. He, he's not happy about the idea of kindergarten. We, uh, we told him, do you want a new backpack for school? And he got quiet and looked at me and went, I want a new backpack. And I said, for school? And he goes, no school. <laughs> uh, I don't think he realizes that those are hand in hand, probably a poor kid. He has been, because of the pandemic, he has been inside with us for two years. Um, so my child's gone feral. <laughs> like we took him to Furthermore this year, and he was hugging everyone. And people are like, looking at him like, we're sorry, he has forgotten how people work. Uh, we went to the gas station. We were at the gas station. He goes into the gas station, and the gas station in the small town I live in has such a wonderful staff. They really are. They're just a, an amazing staff. Um, that I've had that job in the past. I know how hard it is to actually be nice to people. <laughs> like, that's why I chose a career where I don't have to be nice to people anymore. Um, but the, the guy behind the counter is just me, and my little son looks up and goes, I want a hug. And the gas station clerk goes, oh, buddy, I, uh, I, I can't give you a hug. And he goes, a kiss then? <laughs> and we're like, please stop asking for kisses from random people. <laughs> this is going to be an issue as you grow up. <laughs> so, but no, I, um... Ezra's special. Yeah, he is. He's, he is a sweetheart. He has, like I said, he has forgotten how to people over the last two years, but he's... We are, QM is extremely worried about him starting kindergarten. Yeah, uh, why was he? And, and I have said, it, he'll, he'll go the first couple days, he'll hate it, because he's used to being able to get up in the morning, wander the house, watch his shows, eat his snacks, play with his toys, and do nothing else. After the second day, once he has kids that he's playing with there, he's going to love it, he's not going to want to come home. Is it half day or full day? It's full day. Our, our district stopped doing half day right before the pandemic. Yeah, when, when he went in, um, they had a morning session and a half session. Yeah. Fortunately, he was in the morning session. The it, afternoon session, there's no way. That was the same thing when, when I was in kindergarten. It was a half-day thing. It wasn't a full-day thing. Uh, our district, our school district, has five school buildings. Uh, they used to have the one in our town uh, was only kindergarten and first grade. Then they had at another one, second, third, and fourth. Uh, then they had fifth and sixth, and seventh and eighth was at the middle school, then you went to the high school. They closed the one in our town. So now there is one that is K through two, another one that is third through fifth, then the middle school, then the high school. Wow. So I think it's a good split, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, an 11-year-old is a hell of a lot different than a six-year-old. That's very true. Um, so I think it's a good split. I like that, that there's a, a system in Tennessee. It's near Nashville. And I can't remember the name of the university. But the school, one 
big set of buildings. It goes from kindergarten to graduating college. Yeah. The I, I, whole I, system is in one place. I think that's it's wonderful. Amazing. You're not late. You're actually one minute early. But you're here before me, so I'm late. I'm here before <laughs> most people for my panels. I'm not Alcala. <laughs> like, I'm not going to come walking through the door huffing and puffing, except for yesterday morning. If you were in my panel yesterday morning, yeah, sorry about that. Um, If I had a number of people walk in, I will ask the same question I asked earlier. Are there any other lawyers in the room? Wonderful. I can lie to all of you. you know. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. There are no other lawyers. Yeah, I heard at the transportation horror stories panel yesterday, Jake the Bunny taught you all the word allegedly. Allegedly. I kind of wish I had been in the room for that one. You wouldn't tell me what he did. <laughs> Allegedly what he did. Yeah. Allegedly, what he did. Good morning and welcome to Lawyer Horror Stories. I am the Boozy Badger. You'll notice I'm the only one up here. I promise I'm not normally. Typically, I try to have a couple other attorneys up here with me to give you a, a, a broad view. However, all the lawyers I know are like, we're not going to Indianapolis this year. Uh, so it's just me. I apologize right off the bat. There is no leavening factor of other attorneys' experiences. What is Lawyer Horror Stories? Very, very simply, everybody watches TV. You all know the law from TV, and you know what lawyering is like. We all drive BMWs, we all have fancy offices, and we all wear $4,000 suits. Please, for the love of God, stop watching television. <laughs> This is a Q&A panel for any questions that you may have about the practice of law and lawyering in general. If you ask a question, I will ramble for a while and say I hope that answers your question and move on. It does not mean I will actually answer your question, it just means I've lost track of what the hell I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, that said, there are a few ground rules. First, I am a licensed attorney in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and in the United States courts of, uh, that cover that same state. I am not licensed in Indiana. <laughs> that said, do not ask me questions about your specific legal circumstances. Nothing I am going to say today is legal advice. Legal advice is something you get when you walk into an attorney's office. You sit down, you talk with them. They say, I would like a retainer. You pay them a retainer of their choosing. You sign an engagement letter and now you are a client. Up until that point, there is no attorney-client relationship, and nothing they say is legal advice. Please, for the love of God, do not take anything I say in response to a question today. Go commit a crime and then say, but a giant badger told me. It will not hold up in court. <laughs> Number two, as I just said, there is no attorney-client relationship. And you are not my clients. I am not your lawyer. I am a lawyer. I am not your lawyer. Do not ask about your specific legal circumstances because nothing you say in this room full of other people is privileged. Okay? If anyone in this room, including myself, is called to testify about something you have said, we will do so. Finally, do not try to get around the first two rules by phrasing your question as hypothetically. Hypothetically, you're a dipshit. <laughs> Do not say you're asking for a friend. I know you're asking for yourself. We have no friends. <laughs> In my career, I smell bullshit like a fat kid smells cake. I can make that analogy because I was a fat kid and we smelled cake very well. That said, I'll open the floor up for questions. Yes. Okay, here's part of, of my answer, which is, what the fuck is an executive GAD? Okay. Wait a second, there was another level? Oh, no, 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 no,
Where's the school? Purdue. And it is online? It is Purdue's online. It is, is it Purdue's you know, online law school? Okay, so you're not, you're not actually getting a JD, you're getting something that they're calling a JD uh, and, and adding the word executive onto. Um, to, to explain what I just asked, by the way, the, a, a JD, a Juris Doctor, is it, it's the degree you get. It's the lawyer's version of the MD, except without all the heartbreak, pain, and science-y shit. Um, and it is the degree you must have to sit for the bar exam, which is the entry exam into the profession of law. Uh, to have a JD you, uh, that will allow you to sit for the bar in the vast majority of jurisdictions in the United States, I think there's only like three that don't require it. Yeah. Uh, you have to go to an accredited law school. There is one law school accreditation agency recognized in the United States, and that is the ABA, the American Bar Association. Uh, distance learning typically will not qualify for an actual JD, uh, where you can sit for the bar. Uh, what is, let, let me ask the question, what is the cost of this program? It's not that much. I mean, it's through Purdue. Mm -hmm. Forty thousand semester or forty thousand total? total. Okay, and it's one year, three years for forty grand. I don't want to be a lawyer. I mean, I mean, first of all, it's it's not really shorter than it's shorter than part time because a law degree is typically a three year degree if you're going full time. Um, I don't know if I'd suggest it simply because I don't know what a what the program is. Uh, B, 40 grand for an in-state law degree is, like an all law degree that will let you sit for the bar, at some in-state law schools, at some public university law schools, that is the cost of the entire course of study. Uh, third, if it is, like if you're going to get a raise out of doing it, like if they said if you have this you will get a raise, yeah sure. Yeah, well it's to enhance the graduation thing, I travel, like constantly, um, Right. I, I will give you probably the best tip that we got, and it was when I was in law school, they were starting to do something called JD preferred jobs, and they did not require you to be a lawyer, but you were supposed to get a higher rate of pay if you had a Juris Doctorate. Uh, they'd say, oh, you don't have to be a lawyer, you can get a JD preferred position. Well, here's what we all learned after you got out and you tried to get a JD preferred position, but that's it for the bar. Nobody really cares. Like, no one's giving you the rate. If you get the rate, yeah, sure. Otherwise, what I'd say a lot of times, get a master's. Like get an online master's in, in something related to project management or public policy or something like that. It's got to carry a lot more heft because when a lot of these places are hiring, if they see something that looks like a law degree, but they know it's not, if the, if the guy doing the hiring or the pays looking at it says the same thing I am, I did. What the fuck's an executive JD? I was going to get that after maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe it would add something. If it's if it's going to increase what you can ask for salary-wise, yeah, sure, it's probably worth it. Uh, if it's going to be specialized knowledge, probably not, because you're going to get the same type of specialized knowledge from a regular JD, and they're just giving it a really fancy name so that you're willing to pay it for. Any other questions? Jesus. Yes, all the way in the back. So around 10 years ago, I wanted to sue my landlord for not returning my security deposit. Uh, when I served for the paperwork, I did it by certified mail, and the mailman did not get her signature and her printed name. It was only the signature. The judge couldn't read it throughout the case. What should I have done differently? Uh, where was this? Uh, I was living in New York at this time, and I was serving her in Arizona. Okay. So you were suing in New York, though? I was suing her in Arizona. You were suing her in Arizona for a property located in New York? No, no, in, in Arizona. Oh, okay. I, I, here's the thing, though, that landlord-tenant law is insanely state-specific in how it's brought and how it's gone in, so I can't really give an answer on that because you'd be going under the Arizona Rules of Civil Procedure at that point. If you were in Pennsylvania, uh, where, where I practice, I can tell you, uh, landlord-tenant matters and uh, withheld security deposits, you can bring them in either court. You can bring them in front of the magistrate, which is our 
low-level judiciary. Uh, they're an elected lay judiciary. They, they have jurisdiction over civil matters of up to $12,000. Or you could have brought in the Court of Common Pleas. Our Court of Common Pleas is our lowest court of record. It's our trial courts. Uh, and you, there's no jurisdiction limit. Like Pennsylvania has small claims, but we don't have small claims. There's no requirement you be in a small claims court. Uh, and the methods of service varies because the magistrate's court is much more informal. The magisterial rules of civil procedure in that uh, I couldn't have served via certified mail, but I would have served via constable or process server. Uh, unless Arizona authorizes service via certified mail, then I can adopt Arizona's rule to do that. Okay? And, and in our trial courts, there's no such thing with the exception of an out-of-state corporation there's no such thing as service by mail in our trial courts. It must be served by the sheriff. Uh, that's the only person who can make service in Pennsylvania with the exception of certain types of actions. But the way that you make service in those proceedings is always dictated by whatever the rules of court are, whatever the rules of procedure are for that court. There's actually specific rules. It says this is how you make valid service on that. I am assuming that the court you were in likely said you can serve via certified mail, but it's got to got to be certified mail, you know, restricted delivery or something like that, where you have to be able to show that the person who received it is the person who was there, or lived within the same house. Like federally, I can say in a federal, you can, and in most states, uh, you can make service on the party or any other person who lives in their household, any adult person who lives in their household. It's effective service. What likely happened is the judge looked at it and. The judge said, I can't tell who the person who signed it is. So I'm tossing the case. What could you have done at that point? If you were still within the statute of limitations, which is the bar time frame to bring an action, you could have refiled. It likely was not dismissed with prejudice. It was likely dismissed without prejudice, um, depending on what court you were in. Uh, maybe you could have asked the judge to uh, allow you time to perfect service, uh, things like that. I could not really say. I know in Pennsylvania if that happened and I thought service had been thrown out improperly uh, and the bar time frame, the statute had passed on the lawsuit, then I would file an appeal from the dismissal to the Court of Common Pleas because the magistrate, I'm assuming that the judge that did this was likely a lower level judge. Uh, in Pennsylvania, you have an automatic right of appeal from the magistrate court up to the court of common pleas. So I would advise my client, let me, we can file an appeal and get it in front of the court of pleas judge and try to perfect service through that. If we were within the statute of limitations, I probably would have told my client, let's just refile and get a process server. Oh, hey. yeah. Yes. Uh, about the service of process, I want to say like four years ago at this point, I, I worked for an employer that like honestly shut down their business two weeks in the working force. <laughs> and I was driving around, uh, was, like driving around like medicine, nursing homes and stuff one day. And I got a speeding ticket once there, but the, it's like, you know, originally they didn't think it was a huge deal, but they kept bugging for insurance. And my employer never sent like proof of insurance from the vehicle I was trying They didn't give a shit about insurance for a person to give they wanted to be, but I was driving it, they wanted the insurance for that vehicle, but he never said proof of insurance to the delivery. So I got stuck for like a suspended license for like six months in SR22, but I kept trying to get him to call me and work this out, and he just started mm -hmm. like ignoring my calls. Was, uh, and traffic lawyers didn't want to talk to me about this, and I got stuck happening. I can tell you why the traffic lawyers didn't want to talk to you about it. They should have had their own insurance as a defense. You were driving a vehicle without proof of insurance, and you're the one who's liable for that. As to your employer, you probably could have sued them. Yeah, you, you probably could have sued them uh, because they provided you the vehicle in an uninsured manner. Uh, and likely they would have been helping to, to indemnify you, which means be responsible to you for whatever you had to pay out. As far as traffic lawyers go, most of them would say, were you driving the vehicle? Yes. Was it insured? I don't know. And that's the fucking problem. Uh, because the law presumes that you are aware of the insurance status of any vehicle you are in. 
and actually kind of imputes a duty to you to make certain it is insured. It's a shitty answer, but <laughs> I mean, like, like I sympathize with you. I'm not like, oh, your boss was in the right, you were in the wrong. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, that's it, like the employer's shit. I, I completely agree, and you likely would have had a cause of action to force them to identify you for that. Um, a, a frequent thing I have to say, and that every lawyer has to say, when somebody comes in, especially with a story like that, is how is that legal? And we say all types of shitty things are legal. Uh, what is legal and what is just are two entirely different things. What would have been just in that situation would have been if the court system said, this is this kid's employer's vehicle. This kid probably has no idea whether the vehicle is insured or not. He has to get insurance from the employer who doesn't want to give it. Uh, we're not going to suspend his license. He's really not at fault. However, what the law actually says, what, what is legal in that situation, is the law says, if you're in control of the vehicle, we expect you to get to ensure that vehicle is insured. And there is a disparity between the two of what is just and what is legal. And there have been many situations like that where an employer may tell you to do something, right? And that something may end up costing you money in the end. And... What the employer is betting on is you will never sue them. You will never go to labor and industry. You will never file a complaint. You will never do anything about it. They will can you afterwards. They will stick you with the bill. And then they will go, they will never hire a lawyer. And in 90% of the cases, unfortunately, they're completely correct. Because most people, how, how old were you when that happened? Yeah. I, uh, most of you, most of you guys sit there and go, 25 year old, not going to get a lawyer. They may not, they probably don't even know a lawyer. Yes. You know what? Hold on. Can we turn on the green mic? Come, take a microphone, pass it around. It'll make it a hell of a lot easier for everybody in here. Yes, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. I'm like very, very shy and quiet uh, speaker, so. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure I can hear you. No problem, no problem. Like, I don't want you to be asking a question about, you know, why is it like this? And I think you're asking me a question about waffles or something like <laughs> So, but um, I saw this on a YouTube short video, and this was about a couple that got their car towed because of their friend that, who they bailed them out. Um, apparently, didn't show up to court, and I was like wondering, is this legal? And like, how does this work? Um, you know, regarding to like, like if someone, you know, like you know, you, you know, bail someone, like a friend member out of jail, but then they don't show up to court, and then they all of a sudden they sh like um, folks like come in and tell you shit away. Like, how's that? Even? How does this legally work? I have seen the same video. Yes. It, it's, a, it's a big black car and mm -hmm. two yes. older white folk. Yeah, I've seen that the one, same that video. One. Uh, that actually is... All right, I don't know if Indiana still has bail bonds. Does Indiana still have bail bonds? Yes. Because yes. uh, I know that Kentucky did away with them completely. Kentucky does not have bail bondsmen. Pennsylvania, we have bail bondsmen. Um, that was not a court officer that took their vehicle. What happened is those people, their, their buddy got arrested and their buddy had a bail. And the way bail bond works, when there's a bail set and the state has authorized bail bondsmen, uh, you know, if your bail set at $100,000, the bail bondsman doesn't go in and put down $100,000. What they do is they go in, they put down a percentage and a bond for $100,000 to secure the appearance of the person at court. 
So what do you do? Maybe you go into the bail bondsman, you pay the bail bondsman, they get a premium on that for your buddy. But what happens if your buddy doesn't show up? Well, the bail bondsman wants collateral. The bail bondsman may say, look, I want uh, three grand for the bond and you need to put something up as collateral in case your friend doesn't show up because I don't want to be out the next $40,000 for the bond. That couple had gone in, somebody, one of their friends had gotten arrested and watching it, I know what happened, there's probably a 10% bond, the bail bondsman put up the 10% of the actual bond amount, holding the bond in for the rest and told these people, you've got to put up collateral. They put their car up for collateral. Their buddy did not show up for court, meaning the bondsman sacrifices his bond. And when the bondsman has to sacrifice his bond, he's coming for your collateral. That's why that's legal, because what they actually had on the car, when that was put up as collateral, was they had a lien on the vehicle. Same thing as if you don't pay your car note and they send out a repo guy. Same laws apply because the car was offered as collateral to secure appearance. Now, after that, what happens? Um, we still have bounty hunters. Like, you know, you all have heard of Dog the Bounty Hunter. Fucking fuck boy, Jack. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> we still have bounty hunters in the U.S., and what they are, you, you see them, they walk around like they're cops. I'm a bail enforcement agent. Uh, they're jumped up security guards. Uh, but their entire job is they go around for the bail bondsmen. A lot of bail bondsmen actually are bounty hunters. Uh, they go around and they locate you and bring you before the court. Why? Because then they get their bond back. There's an application process where they apply to the court for the release of the bond that they have posted because now they have presented you to the court. Uh, but that's exactly why that car was taken. That's why it's legal. It's the same thing as a vehicle repo. Yes? So I have a... So I have a friend who has law school as his backup plan. Do you have anyone with experiences like that that you have met where it's like they have gone to something else first and then have gone to law school after? Uh, I'm one of them. Uh, my initial plan, I grew up in my father's law office. Uh, my, my father, insanely smart attorney. Uh, I grew up in my father's law office. All of us worked in dad's office at some point in time when we were growing up. And dad looked at each and every one of us and said the same thing. Whatever you do, don't be a lawyer. <laughs> um, I actually, when I decided to go to law school, I was working on a master's in history. Uh, with a focus, a dual focus on you know, the most important areas of history ever. The antebellum socio-political history of the Southern Appalachian Mountain Range from 1840 to 1855. Some real world burning stuff there. And the very much related area of the decline and downfall of the Soviet Union, primarily focusing on 1990 to 1992. Um, and around that time, uh, my first, my, my kids were being born. And I was working on my master's at night with the plan to be to go for a doctorate and teach history. Uh, and I was working at an insurance company during the day and working in my father's office. And my father came to me and uh, had said, he said, he goes, you know, I always told you all not to go to law school. I said, yeah, he goes, you should probably go to law school. <laughs> and it was because I had spent years at that point helping my father research and draft briefs and arguments as a legal assistant in his office. And I'd shown an aptitude for it. Uh, and I thought about that for a while, and then I realized I actually did like the law. Like, it, I, I was fine with it. I enjoyed doing it. Um, and history being very research and writing directed, you know, you always get the idea that law is standing in a courtroom and arguing cases and, and things like that, but like 90% of law is paperwork. It's research and paperwork. Uh, so it was a good fit, and I decided I'll go to law school. I took the LSAT, I got a scholarship, uh, I went to law school, and I've been practicing law ever since, but it was not my first choice of career. 
uh, going to law school can be a good backup plan. Here's the problem with that. If you go to law school as your backup plan, you kind of have to practice law. That's not fun. Uh, it's a lot of money on it. I'll actually tell people when they ask, should I go to law school? One of the very first questions I ask is, do you want to be a lawyer? Because if you don't want to be a lawyer, you're going to incur upwards of $120,000 in debt uh, for a degree that really doesn't have much of a practical application outside of the courtroom. Like, you heard me say J.D. Preferred earlier, yeah, I'm sure those jobs exist. I've never seen people in them. Um, so if that's the backup plan, it's a perfectly valid backup plan. And it can be a good, solid career. Uh, it also depends on how old your friend is, too. Because the, there is, believe it or not, there is a... The older you are, the harder it is to get a good first job in law. Uh, law is to a large degree, a very toxic work environment. Uh, when you're first out of law school, you are the bitch. That's, that's how it's viewed. You're a junior associate. You are the lowest of the low. We refer to you as a baby lawyer. You know nothing. You think you know everything. And it is our job to dissuade you from the idea that you know anything. They want you to work long hours, very long hours. Uh, they want you to be willing to come in on holidays, on your days off. They want you to be willing to take abuse from the senior partner who started practicing law in the early 80s and has not realized that we are 40 years past that point and you can't call people a dumb motherfucker in the office anymore. <laughs> um, and a lot of places realize that the older the baby lawyer, the less likely they are to put up with that shit. So it can be difficult to get your first job out of it. But if you're young enough, or if you want to do it, yeah. There's nothing wrong with having law as a, as a backup career. I would suggest your friend, if they do exercise that, don't tell their clients law was their second choice. <laughs> so it's like, man, eh, I wasn't gonna practice law, but my career as a street performer didn't work out. <laughs> uh, that may put them off a little bit. But there, there's nothing wrong with it. It is, and for anybody who's going to ask, should I be a lawyer, here's, here's the thing. Going with your eyes open, you're not going to get rich. You will not. Now, I have seen the salary spreads they give for lawyers as well, okay? Have you noticed it's always the average salary for lawyers in the area? Yeah, here's the problem with the average salary for lawyers in the area. I practice in the Philadelphia area. There are lawyers in my area who make $30,000 a year. There are lawyers in my area who make multiples of millions of dollars per year. The vast majority of us make somewhere between fifty-five dollars to $90,000 a year. The average is well into the six figures. Why? Because there are lawyers in my area who make multiple millions of dollars per year. It skews the average. Uh, practicing law, if you're doing it to get rich and make money, you certainly can. I, that, I know guys that I went to law school with who are on like the third house now. Um, I know guys that I went to law school with who live in apartments with three roommates and are bartending at night. It's anywhere in between. It all depends on what you're practicing and where you're practicing on it. But it's not a get rich quick. You can live comfortably. You can live okay. You're not going to get rich doing it for the vast majority of attorneys out there. So. Yes? Good follow up for the question. Uh, was recently on a jury. <laughs> was recently on a jury. The defense counsel said they really knew it. Um, being an attorney at only 10 years. How accurate is that? What was that? The uh, defense counsel said they were kind of new at being an attorney, that they were only been working at 10 years. The defense counsel was playing it down. Um, at 10 years, most lawyers have made partner. Uh, just to let you, the old style used to be what we called up and out. Uh, and that's how firms used to operate. You went in as a junior associate. 
and within five years, if you were not on partner track, go find another firm. You're never going to be on partner track. Uh, but by 10 years, you're not a baby lawyer. You're an experienced attorney at a decade in. Um, I think they were probably either A, playing it down, or B, trying to humble brag at that point. Now there are, like, here's a comparison. There are guys in my local bar who have been practicing law for 60 years. Um, and when you're up against one of those guys, even if you're 40 years old, if you're up against this almost 90-year-old lawyer who's still practicing and doing jury work, yeah, you look like a child. I mean, you do. Um, but at 10 years, most lawyers have a good amount of experience. The average career span for an attorney, most attorneys start at about 25, 26 years old of practice, okay? Uh, if you do the math, that means most attorneys are gonna practice about 40 something years before they hit actual retirement age. Uh, which is a misnomer because most attorneys don't retire. What we do is we take our social security and then we cut back on the number of cases we take. But if you look at it that way, at 10 years, you are a quarter of a way into the major part of your practice. Uh, and by 10 years of practice, you're going to have seen most of the things you need to see in an area. Uh, 20 years would be a well-established attorney, 30 years would be very well-established, 40 years would be one of the lawyers who's typically in charge of things at the bar. Uh, 50 years, senior attorney, 60 years, very senior attorney, probably one of the most respected members of the bar if they're still in practice. But 10 years, no, nothing to scoff at. Uh, was it a civil matter or a criminal matter you were on? Uh, it was campaign finance. So civil, yeah. So, uh, well, thank you for serving on your jury. Like, that's that's actually one that's the bedrock. Every lawyer, when you say that, like, I was on a jury, and. There's two answers. One is, did you enjoy that great $12 a day in validated parking? Um, the other one is, thank you for doing it, because the system does not work without juries, uh, quite obviously. So thank you. That is important. Uh, no, any other questions? Right over here. To skip some of the more serious stories of lawyer doing being a lawyer, what are some of the more comedic stories that you've had, like experienced while being in a courthouse? Yeah, what was it? I know there's a lot of like serious court cases that you have to go through being a lawyer. Have you had any comedic or any funny type of stories in a courthouse? Funny stories in a courthouse? Yeah. Oh God! <laughs> courthouses are ninety percent hilarity. Um, I'm not joking either. Like courthouses really are like ninety percent hilarious. Like you. Here's the thing, when you hear about a legal matter, as a member of the general public, you are hearing about it because it is shocking, it is scandalous, or it is depressing. Right? That's the only time most folks who aren't involved in a lawsuit hear about a lawsuit. It's on the news, and it's on the news because it's typically like it's some horrible thing, right? The day-to-day -day lawsuits are the best. I. Um, I, I'm not the only lawyer who does this either. Uh, there's a Goodwill up the street from my office, and I keep in the back of my car on court days where I have clients appearing in front of a judge for first appearances or something like that. Uh, I keep a collection of slacks, blouses, and button-ups that I have purchased from the Goodwill in various sizes. I tell my clients, meet me in the parking garage. I'll be on the fourth floor in my space. And they'll come up so I can look at what they're planning on wearing in front of the judge and give them new clothes to change into if needed. And you think, oh, listen, if you're going in front of the judge on, oh, say a solicitation charge, do you all know what a solicitation charge is? It's prostitution. Um, if you're maybe don't show up in the sweatpants with the word juicy AF on the ass. <laughs> Your marijuana possession case, 
leave the t-shirt with Kermit the Frog smoking a blunt at home that day. Uh, one of my favorites though, and it actually happened fairly recently, uh, my, my favorite part of doing legal work, very honestly, is cross-examining a witness. I love cross-examination. Uh, on direct examination, it's about letting the witness tell their story. On cross-examination, the way we teach young lawyers to do cross-examination is what the witness has to say doesn't matter. You're the one who's actually telling the story. They're the, just there to confirm or deny what you're saying. Uh, but it was on cross-examination. I was cross-examining someone, and I was like, so what's your name? Bob Smith. Bob, what do you do? Construction. And how long have you been doing construction? 20 years. Bob, now it's true on this job, everything didn't go correctly. Well, yeah, everything didn't go correctly. And I'm like, oh, shit. He's like, yeah, now first we got up on the roof, then we screwed up ripping off the tiling, then we got the shingles down and pounded the nails through the roof, and it leaked, damaged everything below. We went and looked at it, clearly our fault. We weren't supervising the job correctly. I'm like, I'm like, this was a yes or no question. <laughs> okay. But the guy goes on and in depth in response to that fourth question I asked on cross-examination, admitted to every element of liability I needed. Like, went on for like 10 minutes. And I'm sitting there, like my client's sitting there, and I'm sitting there with my client and I are looking at him, we're like, And he gets done, and I'm just silent for a second. And I, and the judge looks and knows me, looks at me and goes, Mr. Taylor, and I go, well, one moment, Your Honor. I need to check my notes. <laughs> I walked over to my desk, and I'm going over my notepad, and I'm like, mm -hmm, you admit to that, you admit to that, you admit to that. <laughs> Your Honor, I feel like I should ask another question, but I think we're good. <laughs> And his lawyer's just sitting here the whole time. <laughs> uh, there was another one that I thought of. It was a, a certain type of case. And the attorney for, uh, for the, I, I represent the defendant. And my whole goal in this, it was a civil matter, it was a domestic matter. That's all I can really say about it. My whole goal was to basically show X thing did not happen. That's it. They had to establish that X thing likely happened and that the order should be granted. And I had to establish or, or poke holes and then establishing that by going off the circumstances surrounding it to say X thing didn't happen and there's no cause to grant this. And it, one of those rare cases where I actually believed X thing didn't happen. The plaintiff was um, a dancer. <laughs> Yeah, one person understands what I mean. <laughs> the, the plaintiff was a dancer, and their attorney, who's a really nice guy, I know him, we're friends. Like we're, we're really friendly with each other. I've had cases with him, we're both on the same side. Uh, but God bless him, he is the Lionel Hutz of my bar association. Like, we found out he was sleeping in his office, and it's never a good sign when the word gets around that you're sleeping in your office, because it means shit has gone down. Uh, he shows up to court. He's got a dollop of shaving cream under his ear, and I'm like, you know, now I'll, I'll call him Bob. For the, you know, Bob, come here, come here. He comes over, I go, um, you got shaving cream under your ear, man. He goes, oh, shit. And he wipes it off real quick. He goes to talk to his client. He goes, he goes, can we talk about possibly resolving this? I said, yeah, sure, let's go over. So we go over to the DA's waiting room. He's not a DA, it's just we all, on that floor of the courthouse, we all use the DA's waiting room to talk about things. The DA knows we do it, they don't care. Uh, and we're sitting there and he goes, well, you know, um, I've got a, a pretty significant piece of evidence here and my client thinks that it'll prove all of their claims. And I go, well, I'd be interested in knowing what it is. And he pops open his briefcase, reaches in, and pulls out a five-gallon bag of human hair. And he goes, he, he holds it out, he goes, see? And I go, that is a bag of hair. 
And he goes, yeah. I go, how does that prove anything other than your client has been saving human hair in a bag? And he goes, well, my client thinks. And I go, Bob, I know what we're doing here. And your client won't let it drop. But are you really going to try to put a five-gallon bag of human hair into evidence as proof of something? And he's quiet. He goes, I got it over my head. I'm like, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> So we go into the courtroom, and in all credit, even when you have a bad, like I say that, it makes it sound like he's bumbling and fumbling, but he wasn't. We all have shitty cases. That's just the nature of the beast. You get bad cases. And what do you do when you have a bad case? The best you can. So he tries to make it. He gets her on the stand, gets her testimony. I stand up. I do my cross-examination. I just rip apart uh, every part of that testimony. And it is just very, very clear to everyone in the courtroom by the end of the testimony that what she was alleging had not actually occurred and that this order was going to be denied. The judge was telegraphing, like the judge is sitting up there and she's just like, the whole time, like makes eye contact with me and goes, and I go. <laughs> um, he realizes this. Now, after cross-examination, you don't see this a lot. There's something called redirect. You, you direct your witness, right? Then you tender your witness to the opposition. They cross-examine your witness. The opposition then tenders the witness back to you, if you wish, for redirect to kind of clarify things that were discussed on cross, right? So I tender the witness back to Bob. And Bob stands up and he makes a big show. <coughs> Miss <clears throat> Susie Q. I've never been alone with you at your house, have I? <laughs> no. And you've never been alone with me at my office, have you? No. Nothing further. <laughs> Sits down. And the judge and I both exchanged and the look between the judge and I was just <laughs> Come to find out that this client uh, of his, as I found out later, had a habit of every time they lost a lawsuit, they would file inappropriate conduct complaints against their attorneys. None of them were ever found in. The bar takes that shit seriously. Like, the bar looks into those things. They take them very, very, very fucking seriously. So the fact that none of them were ever found in tends to mean they didn't happen because you know what it takes to suspend a lawyer on something like that? Not proof positive, just the bar feeling like something happened. But they're a pain in the ass because whether the bar believes it happened, whether you know it happened or it didn't happen, the bar association investigations can take over a year and for that year they are completely in your office. And if they find anything, they ding you on it. Related to the initial complaints or not. I realized after learning this that what Bob was doing was building a record under oath <laughs> so that if a bar complaint was filed, because he, that was him going, I am going to lose this case. They are not going to be happy and they're going to file a complaint against me and offer to withdraw it if I give them their money back. He was building a record under oath. So then when they said, I've got to file a bar complaint saying this happened, he can say, but you already testified it didn't, so. <laughs> uh, that's just, that, that's normal in the court. Like, shit like that happens on a daily. I had one last week. I appeared for my client, stop paying me. That happens. Sometimes your clients don't pay, but you have to get out of the case. And the way you get out of the case, if your client's not talking to you because your client doesn't want to pay you anymore and they know if they talk to you, you're going to say, hey, about that bill I have outstanding, is you have to file a motion to withdraw with the court. The court sets a hearing, gives everybody a chance to appear, and you notify everybody. It was a cattle call day. And a cattle call day is just a court day where there's a bunch of people on the docket. Like, you know, you may have 15 cases on the docket. There's a bunch of lawyers there. There's a bunch of... Uh, participants sitting in the gallery, and I know this judge well. I've been in front of this judge for a long time. Um, 
So they call the case. The judge looks up there, gets on the bench, goes, we'll take you first, Mr. Taylor. I said, okay, Your Honor. I got up. I stood there, and the judge looks at me and goes, well, it seems like um, your client and the plaintiff reached an agreement. I said, yeah. I said, it seems like your client is abiding by the agreement. Yes. And the plaintiff asked for continuance to make sure the agreement is fulfilled. I said, yes. And, they, and she said, you filed a motion of withdrawal? Yeah. And she goes, so to use the legal phrase, you're getting out while the getting's good. And I said, more or less, Your Honor. And she goes, wonderful. Granted, signs the order. And said, yeah. <laughs> Now, there are like 10, 15 lawyers sitting there, and every one of them starts laughing. <laughs> because the people in the gallery, the litigants, were just so shocked at how informal that was, whereas every other lawyer's like, this is a motion to withdraw. Every judge used to be a lawyer. None of them are making you stay in a case if you're not getting paid anymore. <laughs> uh, another question. Yes, Mama T. You mentioned the bag of human hair. Yes. Put into evidence. Have you ever had other items put into evidence that you maybe wished you hadn't? Like, I don't put things into evidence. Well, not, not, I, I don't mean that. Let's them. say they have been put into evidence. So many dildos. <laughs> <laughs> Any bad dragon. Now, so I, was, I was thinking more along the lines of, well, I mean, you did mention a couple of shitty cases. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> How many people already know this story? Okay, enough that I have to tell it. Um, so, first of all, there, there's something called lawyer retention rule. And the lawyer retention rule says you have to retain your client file for X amount of time after the close of the case. You, just, you have to be there. <laughs> Typically, X amount of time is whatever the statute of limitations on legal malpractice is. Uh, and the rule is put in place to make sure you're not like trashing your file if you fuck up a case, right? And that includes any evidence you put in. I had a case years and years ago um, of someone who had contracted with somebody else to do some work and uh, there was a disagreement. And somebody pooped on the floor. And the person came in, they were telling me, I said, well, that's definitely an issue. They said, um, do you want to see the pictures? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, yes. <laughs> so they bring in pictures, and like you're thinking what I was thinking, which is like cell phone shots, right? No, like these were like fucking backlit pictures of a pile of human feces on a carpet. <laughs> Like school qual, like in the bottom corner, they read Life Touch. There was a laser background, and, and I'm like, okay. I said, well, that's um, certainly interesting, and so all we we know it's there. All we have to do is link it to this person. And they're like, oh, well, couldn't we DNA test it? And I said, number one, that doesn't happen. Number two, that would require you to actually have the feces. And they got quiet. There's times in life. <laughs> times in life where you realize you shouldn't ask a question, <laughs> but you do anyways. And this is one of those times, like I'm sitting there, I'm like, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. But what comes out of my mouth is, do you still have the poop? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, do you want to see it? And I'm like, did you bring it? <laughs> and then what's in the car, I'm like, you left it like this is summer. I'm like, you left it in the car? Dear God, is the AC on? Does it have its favorite music playing? <laughs> so they go out and they come in with a Tupperware container. And they open it up and uh, I'll tell you what, Tupperware really does keep things moist. <laughs> So they, they ended up retaining us. We settled that case, actually. We settled it during uh, depositions, which do you all know what depositions are? Uh, depositions are uh, when you, in a civil matter, when you get to force people to testify before trial. And they're much more wide ranging, but basically you get to ask them questions and hear how they're responding and see if you can find what we call more discoverable information. There's a phase in every lawsuit called discovery where basically everybody trades what they have and ask questions of each other. Like this whole idea of, I have a surprise witness, doesn't fucking happen. 
Like, that's not a real thing. We know who your witnesses are, and most of the time we know what they're going to say because we have to pose them in advance. And this guy was there, and uh, my question was, did you defecate in that room? As a sign. And he goes, oh, absolutely not. I'd never do anything like that. Da, da, da. And I said, would your answer change if I could present the poop? And we settled that matter. <laughs> I say you have to retain your file, and you do, but you don't have to retain the original. You can retain copies of your file. Like, you can give the originals back to your clients as long as you keep copies of everything that's in your file. Well, what was in my file was a Tupperware container full of shit. <laughs> and um, I don't know how I would have made a copy, like maybe some brown Play-Doh and a sculpting knife. <laughs> but uh, my, my client never came back for it. So for years, in one of my filing cabinets, there was a Tupperware container with feces in it. I, I made the mistake of telling that story once, and now everybody asks me about it. Somebody's like, how is it? How is it? How is it? And I'm happy to report that as of two years ago, the retention period's fucking up. <laughs> so, so there's no law. I do have the Tupperware, though. Yeah. Well, what do you take your lunch to work in? Probably for two more questions. Yes, right over here. How often do you get somebody that confesses to you in confidentiality before the case that they actually did it, but still expects you to defend them <laughs> like it didn't happen? All right, this is going to be a fun one. Um, first of all, people confess all the time to their lawyers. And I, I actually often will say if there's one person you can confess to, it is your lawyer, because we can't fucking say anything. Um, second, if they confess to me and they expect me to still defend them, they're right. I will. My job is not to be the arbiter of whether what you did was right or wrong, or whether you're a good person or a bad person, or let my personal feelings come into play. My job, especially in criminal matters, which you are likely referring to, is to force the state to prove their case. That is how the system works. I don't care if you do. Like, as a human, as a thinking and feeling human being with morals, of course I care. As an attorney, I don't care. I care to the extent that it impacts the case I can present. Because my job is to make the state prove their burden. Does that mean that if you say, I absolutely did it, I can go in there and say, my client didn't, didn't do it? No. Actually, there is an ethical duty uh, of every attorney called candor to the tribunal. And that means we cannot present evidence or argument that we know is false. So how do you do that when your client has said, oh, no, I did it? And you have to make the state prove their case. You just don't argue that they're innocent. You argue they can't prove that your guy's guilty. That's how you make your case. It's, you, don't, you don't argue they didn't do it. You argue they can't prove he did it. You don't argue he was in another town that night. You argue they can't prove he wasn't in another town that night. That's how you make that argument. That's how you do that. Uh, does it impact how you present the case? Absolutely. 100%. A uh, story from my father. My father would do criminal work. He had a guy once who had been charged with a crime. And dad walked in, sat down across from him, looked at him, and said, uh, there are three ways that the, he said, I'm your attorney. There are three arguments I can make. However, understand, I cannot say you did not do it if you tell me you did it. So, one, you weren't there and you didn't do it. It's probably not going to be good because they got video showing you were there. Two, you were there and you didn't do it. Three, you were there and you did do it. If you argue that, I can't argue one or two. So I'm going to go out in the hall, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, I'm going to come back in here, I'm going to sit down, you're going to tell me what happened. And Dad got up, went out in the hallway, 
got a cup of coffee, said hello to the police officer, walked back in, sat down, and said, okay, buddy, which is it? And he goes, well, I was there, but I didn't do it. And Dan said, all right, let's get to work. <laughs> that guy definitely did it. <laughs> like, there, there's more than one time where, like, you're sitting there and your client's going, <clears throat> I didn't do it, I wasn't even there. And you're like, no, no, I got no reason to doubt you. And they leave, and you look at your partner, and you're like, oh, they fucking did it. Like, intellectually, we know they did it. But we also know why our client's telling us they didn't do it. Um, but you make the case you have, and you argue that case. It's a common misconception whenever somebody's like, oh, criminal defense attorneys are sleazeballs. I'm like, yeah, some are. Of course, fucking some DAs are sleazeballs. Um, but the point of a criminal defense job is it is not you are defending what the person did. It is that you are making the state prove their case. That's your job. That is the job. That's what it is. To the extent that one of the tenets of legal ethics, it's one of our very first ones, is representation of a client is not an endorsement of the client. Their positions are their actions. So, uh, we got time for one more. I have seen all the way back there. You have had your hand up several times. I'm just curious, but like, because you've talked about clients and, and just the morals of it all and like them not telling you if they did it, whatnot. But what was, or who was the worst client you've had that you still had to go through a case with? I mean, like, you, you understand, understanding that anything that I've anonymized, I've left out details, I've enhanced details, I've done things like that to make my clients not recognizable. Um, <clears throat> I'm always loath to tell this in any form. Um, there are two types of cases I do not take anymore. Okay? One is heroin dealers. I don't take cases with heroin dealers. I had a cousin OD'd on heroin, died young. The other is um, child molestation. Uh, the reason I don't take those is I had a few of those cases. And there is something about, because DAs hand over the evidence. Like, that, that's a thing. In criminal matters, a DA will give you the evidence that they have to review so you know what they're presenting at trial. And when you're looking through binders of horrible acts, just horrible acts, um, it impacts. It has a, a strong impact. And you, you are, as an attorney, bound to zealously represent the interests of your client. So you take the case and you zealously represent the interest of your client to get to their best interest. Sometimes the best interest, most of the time in cases like that, the best interest is not going to trial. Um, most of the time the best interest of your client is to get a very favorable plea agreement. Uh, but you do that and you kind of want to go home and scrub with steel wool. Uh, I said earlier that, you know, that one of the tenets of it is an attorney is not endorsing the actions or positions of their client by representation. They are representing their client. And that the job is to make the state prove the case and to, to make them uphold their burden. And that it doesn't matter whether they're guilty or innocent and everybody gets rights. And the truth of the matter is the dirty secret that a lot of guys don't tell you in law is those are the things we tell ourselves so we can do our job. Um, it's not a hard, you know, I have kids. That case sickened me. And when I say I don't take those cases, I don't take those clients anymore, there's an easy, well, easy for me to say, but not easy for people under, to understand reason. It is not because I would refuse to provide them with good representation. It is because I do not trust myself to provide them with the level of representation I believe everybody deserves within a courtroom. I've recognized over the years that I do have emotional and moral attachments, and uh, given those, I cannot say. I don't know what the hell's going on out there, but it sounds more interesting than this. Um, but, but I cannot say over the years that I, um, 
I trust myself on that. And I, I talk to other guys who do criminal defense work, who do work like that, and we all agree. When you turn down a client, it's not because of that. It's because you don't trust yourself to actually give them that level. You think subconsciously you may take some action that impacts the case negatively. Um, but the key to that, and the key to remembering that is, the way our justice system is set up is an adversarial justice system. And uh, we always require that when the state seeks to deprive somebody of liberty, they must uh, deprive somebody of their liberty, they must prove every element of their defense of uh, their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's beholden on it. Uh, to the extent that it is so beholden in the theory of law, it's not always how it's practiced, but in the theory of law that we have a name for it, Blackstone's Ratio. William Blackstone was an English jurist who wrote something called Blackstone's Commentaries. It is widely regarded as the first collection of common law precedent ever. And in there, they wrote the precedent that we should go by criminal law with. And it is, it is better that 10 guilty men go free than one guilty man be imprisoned, or one innocent man be imprisoned. The idea being that as a society, we should be willing to accept the risk that 10 people who commit crimes, possibly very heinous crimes, should be allowed to go free at trial if imposing less strict standards would result in one innocent person going to prison for a crime they did not commit. Now, is that how it works? William Blackstone, is that how it actually works? No. And no, and yeah, a moment ago when I said there are cases you don't want to take to trial, and the one I was describing is one of them, oh, I'm just telling you right off the bat, anything related to child abuse or child sex crimes, whether you did it or not, you are guilty the moment you sit down in that courtroom and your attorney is fighting to prove your innocence. That's just how it is. It's a visceral reaction. A very visceral reaction. It's such a visceral reaction and a known problem. And this is not me saying, oh, those poor criminals. It is just the reality of the system and how that works. Um, when you take on those types of clients, there is suggested training for the attorney. You know what that suggested training is for? How to recognize the risk of suicide. Because it is very, very common for defendants of certain types of crimes, whether they did it or not, or anything, uh, whether they did it or whether they didn't do it, uh, to kill themselves. It's very common. And they actually suggest when you take those cases on, that you take a form of training in recognizing the risk of suicide in your client because that is one of the few situations we are allowed but not required to break confidentiality is if we think you're planning on hurting yourself or another person. Uh, so, yeah. But I don't take those cases anymore, so I don't worry about it. Um, that said, that is the time. Thank you all for coming out. Please enjoy the rest of your presentation. Silver Gato Man, he bought me a coffee. Silver Gato Man, here is the song for thee. He likes to video all the panels at the cons. You should go and watch them, whether they are short or long. Silver Gato Man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.